Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening. Welcome to Books and Books. Thank you so much for joining us this evening on this very special event we have this evening. If I could take just a moment of your time to alert you to our Books and Books newsletter. You want to pick up a copy of this tonight, of course, when you're buying a copy of Hannah's book. This will give you a rundown of all the wonderful events we have at Books and Books every night of the week. Uh, upcoming of note, uh, Nelson DeMille will be here at the store. We have his new book. Uh, we're having a conversation with Salman Rushdie that will be at the uh, Wilson campus downtown. We have tickets on sale for that. And also Nicholas Sparks at the end of the month. We have tickets on sale for that. So any number of these events uh, to your liking, uh, pick up a copy of this. If not, there's an email list going through the audience. You can give us your email address, and that way we can alert you to all these. Uh, in addition to tonight um, uh, being live streamed, you can also go on and see any archived events that we've had over the past few months. This is sort of a new thing for us, and we have a lot of people watching. Uh, for those of you who are watching, call this number and uh, we can get a book signed for you before the event is over and we can ship it to you. We'll uh, uh, mail it to you. I'll take it to your house myself, whatever you want. But tonight it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Hannah's publisher. Um, Hannah Kent's Barrier Rights is a brilliant literary debut inspired by a true story. The final days of a young woman accused of murder in Iceland in 1829 set against Iceland's stark landscape. Hannah Kent brings to vivid life the story of Agnes, who, charged with the brutal murder of a former master, is sent to an isolated farm to await execution. But, again, publisher Judy Klain, who will be formally introducing Hannah, she's the vice president and editor-in-chief of Little Brown and Company, where she's worked since 1998. She focuses on story-driven, upmarket literary fiction, narrative nonfiction, memoirs, and strong suspense novels. Some of the novels she has edited include the New York Times bestseller Room by Emma Donahue, the Girls by Lori Lanzins, The Fig Eater by Jody Shields, and To Be Sung Underwater by Tom McNeil. Nonfiction titles she has edited include the New York Times bestsellers The Horse Boy by Rupert Isaacson, Lunch in Paris by Elizabeth Bard, and Julie Powell's Julia and Julia, as well as Maria Semple's Where Do You Go, Bernadette. Gives me great pleasure to introduce her this evening. Please welcome Anna Klein. It is such a pleasure to be here. You know, I was here in May. Um, we often, when we have a book that we're really excited about, we do what we call pre-sale dinners with booksellers, independent booksellers, because we really believe that independent booksellers are the people who start talking about books and spread the word. But because Hannah was coming to the BEA in New York and was going to be here for her tour, it seemed because she lives in Australia, flying her back and forth three times was going to you know, wear her out and not really work. So I came to talk about the book and um, had the pleasure of having this fantastic dinner with some of the books and books people and then came and sat in the courtyard here afterwards. So it's really nice to be back. But I wanted to say that oftentimes people ask, you know, uh, an editor, how did you hear about the book? And usually it's, in fact, it's not a very interesting story. I mean, usually it's, you know, an, an agent sent it to me. I opened my email, I read it, and I liked it. But actually the story of hearing about Hannah's book was a little bit more interesting, so I thought I'd told you about, tell you about that. So I was invited to um, the Adelaide Writers' Festival, um, and in fact, coincidentally, had just been in Sydney, Australia, and had come back and probably had had the worst jet lag. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Australia, but it is like being uh, uh, tortured when you get back, because it's 14 hours difference, and it, it took me about six weeks, practically. I'm very wimpy of me to get over. I'm slightly exaggerating. And then I got invited to Adelaide, and I thought, oh, my God, I don't even know if I can deal with this you know, flight back again. <laughs> but while I was there, one of the things they do is they introduce you to booksellers and agents, and you have this sort of speed dating where you hear about books that are being written by Australian authors. And while I was there, was, there was only one book that I, I heard about and really felt like this could be something. And it was just a one-sentence or two-sentence pitch, and it was the story of burial rights and... Um, the agent said, this is a young woman, she's writing this book, she hadn't even finished writing it yet, and it's called Burial Rights, and it's based on a true story about um, a woman who was the last woman to be executed for murder in Iceland in, in the 1830s, and extraordinarily written by an, uh, by an Australian who went to Iceland and, and discovered the story and was so obsessed that 10 years later she decided to write this book. And in my notebook, I sort of kept my notebook because I had circled, this could be good. And then about six months later, I got a call from a New York agent who was handling it and said, you know, I'm sending it to you. And probably almost, I don't know, sometimes I think there's an almost sixth sense when you start to read something. I mean, as a reader, we all know, you start to read and you know you, you just love it right away and you hope that it stays that good. And I think as editors, it's the same thing in a way. It's like being, it's, it's being a reader is the first thing you are. And I think 
eight lines in, eight sentences in, I just sort of stopped at my desk and thought, oh my God, just pray that it stays this good because I know I'm going to buy this book. And, and I did. And the rest is history. And here is Hannah, who um, is going to tell you so many great things that I'm not going to take up any more of your time. But thank you. And it's so great to be here. Thank you, Judy, for that amazing introduction. Can you all hear me okay? And thank you all to everyone here who has come here tonight. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here in the US. I, I arrived in New York for the very first time in April, as Judy mentioned, and this is the second city I've seen outside of New York. And I must say, at the moment in Australia, it is freezing cold. We have, of course, the you know, opposite seasons. So it's a real treat to come somewhere where it's so warm and so humid. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Uh, tonight, I thought I'd talk a little bit about where the idea for my debut novel, Burial Rights, came from. Um, many people, especially in Australia, um, where it came out some months earlier, have asked me why I decided to write my first book about a murderess in 19th century Iceland, of all places. And really, to explain myself, I probably have to take you back about 10 years, when I was 17 years old and fresh out of high school. Like a lot of teenagers finishing secondary education, I was quite terrified at the prospect of selecting a, a career path, basically. I knew I had to make an appropriate university course, I had to choose one, I had to go forth and, I guess, set myself on the tracks towards a career, which I really had no clue what would be most appropriate, what would be most suitable to me. And so... Basically, by means of a, a deferral tactic, I applied for a 12-month Rotary Exchange program. And I hear you have Rotary Exchange also here in the US. Well, for those of you who might not be familiar with the exchange program, you basically apply to be sent somewhere for a year and you nominate three countries that you would like to be considered for, but the Rotary Committee make the final destination after interviewing you and, and selecting you for the program if you're lucky. And I made it through several rounds of interviews and then I came to, to the final one where I was seated in front of three panellists. And the countries I had put down as my preferential countries were Sweden, Iceland and Switzerland. And the reason I had selected those three countries was because I had never seen snow before and I desperately, as a 17-year-old, wanted to see some snow. Anyway, I remember sitting in front of these three panellists and they asked me all sorts of questions. And then one of them turned to the others and said, Hannah, how would you respond if you were sent somewhere where it was dark 24 hours a day in winter? And I think I surprised them with how enthusiastic I was. I think I must have said something like, that would be fantastic. I'd love to experience that. Something so different from my hot Australian summers. And I do remember one of the Rotarians making a cross next to my name on the sheet of paper in front of him and sort of raising his eyebrow at the others. And sure enough, in a few weeks' time, I received a letter saying that I would be sent to Iceland, whereas everyone else Everyone else who applied for that particular program in that year was sent to France or the US. <laughs> so this is why in 2003, I left my home in Allgate in South Australia, just outside Adelaide, for So the Croker, which is a small fishing village in the north of Iceland. They didn't even send me to Reykjavik. I had to look up this town in my home atlas when I saw it on that letter, and I couldn't even find it in the atlas. I actually had no idea where I was going. This uh, Sutha Croker is, a, as I said, very small, fairly isolated town that lies snug in the side of a fjord and comprises not much more than a hospital, a school and a clutch of little colourful buildings that face an iron grey sea. When I arrived, it was January. I left a, a 40 degree Celsius, I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit, degree heat wave in Adelaide and rocked up in January where the days were gripped by darkness for probably about 20 hours at a time. And the sunlight, if you could probably even call it sunlight, was nothing more than this very brief, intensely blue twilight that seemed to sort of lift in at about 11 o'clock in the morning and entirely abandon you by three in the afternoon. There were no trees whatsoever. The town's houses were hostage to snow and vile winds that would come in from the north. And in the distance, beyond the fjord, 
the North Atlantic Ocean met the North Sea in what to me, the 17-year-old exchange kid, thought was a suggestion of oblivion. It felt like the absolute edge of the world. My first host family, I had three in the end, my first host family were very, very generous to take me in and sponsor me and were only ever civil and polite to me. But in those first few months of my exchange, I became intensely lonely. The community of Sotherkroka was very tightly knit, as most small communities tend to be, and as the exchange student, I was undoubtedly the outsider in town. Everyone seemed to know who I was, even before I had even met them, but no one spoke to me. And I have this, this strange memory, or it's not a memory, it's not strange rather, this is what happened to me. I have this very clear memory of walking to high school. I'd finished in Australia, but I had to attend high school as part of my exchange. I was walking to school in the snow, in the darkness of the morning, when I, I heard a car pull up next to me. And I, hear, I heard it slow down, and I turned around, and I could see that it was a big black sort of sports utility vehicle. And in Adelaide, if a big black car slows down when you're walking alone in the dark, you speed up. So that's exactly what I did. I started walking faster. The car also came up and then slowed down when it reached me again. And then I thought, this is quite strange. It's going way too slow. There's something fishy is going on here. So I turned around and I looked at them. The car stopped entirely. The windows were rolled down. And all the faces of the car's occupants peered outside the window. And then they started talking with one another. And I could hear them say, Hanna, or Australia, which means Australia. I knew that much. But no one said anything to me. But they were obviously just slowing down, as I realised, to have a look at this Australian kid that they had heard was in town. It was very, very surreal. So for the first time in my life, I had a very wonderful childhood. So really, for the first time in my life, I felt socially isolated in this small town of Sotherkroka. And my feelings of alienation were completely compounded by the claustrophobic winter darkness and the constant confinement indoors because of the bad weather. At the local high school, I understood absolutely nothing. I don't know if anyone has ever attempted to learn French in Icelandic, but it does make you feel impossibly stupid. Um, <laughs> So what I ended up doing was basically turning to writing for company. And in fact, I turned to the library to fill the black hours and I sought consolation in the shelf of English books, the single shelf of English books that they had there. Now, it was during the very first difficult months of my exchange that I was driven through a place in the north called Vatstalshollar. I was with my host family and we were, were returning northwards after a visit in the south where they were seeing some relatives. And uh, we came up, there's one main road, basically, which goes around Iceland, which is called Highway 1. And we were travelling this road and we got towards the north country. And for any, has anyone here been to Iceland before? Oh, a few people. Oh, great. So you'll know how extraordinary the landscape can be but around the south. But once you get to the north, it really seems to open up and you have this fantastic sublime countryside you have these very old valleys which have been carved out by glaciers kind of divided by these mountain ranges and it's all pastoral land and because there's no trees you can always see the horizon and you feel very vulnerable and very present in this landscape in a way I think you don't always in others so we're driving along this very sweeping gorgeous pastoral sort of countryside when you come to an area on the highway one Vatstalsholla, where the earth seems to suddenly gather itself up and sweep up into these hundreds of small hills. It's very difficult to describe and basically because it's so bizarre and it, you can't really compare it to anything else. The hills are basically no, less high than the ceiling. They probably wouldn't quite reach it and there's hundreds of them all of a sudden just coming up out of the earth like a rash of pimples. And to me, they look like nothing more than than basically burial mounds. I'd seen a documentary about Vikings and I'd seen these mounds where they used to bury their ships and I thought, goodness, that, that might be it. So I asked my host family if that's what they were. And they looked at them and they said, oh, no, no, that's not it. And I said, what is it? And they said, we don't know. I later found out it was an avalanche some several hundred years ago that caused them. But they did say that the area was significant. They pointed to three small hills as we passed them that were nestled quite closely together. 
Over 100 years ago, they told me, a woman called Agnes Magnus Dotted had been beheaded there upon those three hills. She was the last person to be executed in Iceland. I was, upon hearing this, immediately curious, as I think anyone would be on hearing a snippet of a story like that. And I asked them what this woman, Agnes, had done and what had happened. And I discovered that Agnes had been a 34-year-old servant woman who had been beheaded by Broadaxe on the 12th of January in 1830 for her role in the murder, the very brutal murder, of two men. The crime, as it has more or less been recorded throughout the years, supposedly went along these lines. In the early hours of the 14th of March in 1828, a servant woman, Agnes Magnus Dottir, woke up the people living at a farm called Stapakoti on a very remote peninsula in North Iceland, telling them that Ilugastadir, the farm next over but still some distance away, where she lived and worked as a servant, was burning down. She told the Stapakoti family that Ilugastadir stood in bright flames, those were her words, and that the farmer and her employer, a man called Natan Kettleson, and also another guest for the night, a man called Pieter Jonsson, were still trapped inside the croft. The Stapakoti family ran back through the night with Agnes to try and help extinguish the fire, but by the time they arrived at Ilugastadir, they were too late. The bodies of the men were discovered badly burnt in their beds after they had managed to put the flames out. When it grew light the following morning, one of the neighbouring farmers inspected the men's corpses and he thought he saw stab wounds on their bodies. He called over another member of his family, or another servant, and together they had another look. And then they noticed blood on remnants of unburnt clothing. They became suspicious and they quietly alerted the local authorities. One week later, Agnes and the other young servant at Lugastadir, a girl called Sigur, who was no more than 15 or 16 at this time, were brought before the district magistrate and commissioner, the equivalent of the local sheriff, Björn Blundell. When they were questioned by this man, Blundell, it was realised that these two women had played some role in the death of the men. Basically, as far as I can understand it after my research, their testimonies differed wildly and suspiciously so. When they were confronted with the discrepancy between their testimonials, Agnes and Sigurd then testified that Friedrich Sigurdsson, a 17-year-old farmer's son from the local area, had committed the actual murders. Friedrich was arrested, and while he denied his involvement for some time, after speaking with his local family priest, he eventually admitted his guilt. The judicial trial for these three defendants was quite comprehensive and fairly extensive and it resulted in death sentences for all three, Agnes, Friedrich and Sigurd, although Sigurd's death sentence was later commuted to life imprisonment. It was thought that these three had acted as a gang and planned the attack for money. Uh, Nathan, the farmer, was quite a rich man. Even so, it was Agnes, by far the eldest out of the group, who was unequivocally condemned as the orchestrator of the attack by the small community. So it was, as I first heard it, a very dark, a very tragic and grisly tale. Yet, even upon hearing those first initial details, there was something that intrigued me about this story, or more specifically, about Agnes. Without quite knowing why at the time, I immediately felt what I can probably only now describe as an uncanny kinship when this dead convicted murderess. And retrospectively, and I have been thinking about this a great deal now, especially since the book has come out, I wonder whether perhaps I, th I thought of Agnes as a fellow outsider at the time, and that was perhaps why I was so interested in her story. Possibly I saw something of my own condition, just a tiny fragment of it mirrored back to me in her story of alienation. She too, I think in, I knew intuitively, would have been conspicuous but at the same time entirely avoided in, of course, a much more um, you know, consequential form than I was. I don't mean to compare the plight of a woman condemned to death and that of a homesick 17-year-old kid from Australia, but I think sometimes we are drawn to stories because we find in them some particular emotional resonance that speaks to our current condition. 
Even as I'm very happy to say, my own troubles eased and I fell deeply in love with Iceland as I learned the language and made friends. A compulsion to find out more about Agnes' story continued to grow for me. Who was this woman? And how had she come to such a sad and sorrowful end? Had she truly been the monster that she was represented as in records of the murder? Or was she perhaps instead one of these people whose lives are warped by circumstances, by external forces, social, political, cultural forces? I wanted to know what else might have contributed to her fate other than an inherent supposed wickedness. So looking back now... It is clear to me that as a 17-year-old, I was in some strange way haunted by Agnes and that these feelings I had that were quite irrational at the time were heightened by my lack of knowledge and understanding about her life and also the events that condemned her. Even when I returned to Australia and started a degree in creative writing, thoughts of Agnes continued to both trouble and also fascinate me. And each time I returned to Iceland in the years after my exchange, and I've been back about four or five times now, I wondered about Agnes's life story. Something else that I don't tend to say too often because it makes people think I'm quite mad is that um, I also dreamt of her frequently and I couldn't explain why I was dreaming of her so often. And the dreams were not the sort of passing dreams that you have and then forget upon waking up. They lingered with me. And I think the dreams had a great deal to, they contributed a great deal to my not forgetting her, to my sort of ensuring that this curiosity deepened rather than eventually fading with time. So this quiet preoccupation with a ghost, a figure about whom I knew very little, is probably the most private and idiosyncratic reason why I decided to write about Agnes's life. I needed to reach into the dark and grasp the thing that was haunting me. I needed to exorcise Agnes's presence from my subconscious. The other reason I decided to write this book is because the more I read and translated about the murders, the more I grew completely frustrated at the way in which Agnes was either entirely absent from the records, whereas the men's stories were often told, or if she was there, was present only as this sort of evil woman caricature, as a kind of Nordic Lady Macbeth. I realised that like many women who were convicted of crime in the historic past, Agnes never had an opportunity to contest the misrepresentation of her personality and character in uninformed stereotypes. She was denied a chance to tell her side of the story in her own voice, and I realised that I wanted to attempt to give Agnes a voice of her own, even if it was ultimately only through fiction. Which brings us to burial rites. Burial Rights takes place in 1829, so a year after the murders of Natan Kettelsen and Pieter Jonsson at Alugastadir. Agnes Magnus Dottir has already been found guilty of murder, and the 33-year-old servant, now feared and absolutely detested by the small community that she grew up in, is, has been sentenced to death. She already knows that she will die. At the beginning of the novel, Agnes is taken from Storteborg, which is an isolated residence where she's been detained during her trial, to the northern farmhouse of Cornsall, where she is to remain in custody until the time of her execution. It is here at Cornsall that she meets the farmer's wife, Margaret, and also Toti, the assistant priest responsible for, I guess, offering her spiritual guidance. Margaret the wife, resentful that she, her husband and their two daughters must live in such close quarters with a convicted murderess, is understandably distrustful and hostile towards Agnes. Toti, the assistant reverend, very young, very inexperienced, feels responsible for Agnes's salvation, but also hopes to do right by Björn Blundell, that district commissioner who condemned her. As the summer passes and the light begins to leave the country and the hardships of rural life in 19th century Iceland force the household to work side by side, Agnes's relationships with those around her, including Margaret and Toti, begin to shift and alter. And slowly Agnes, through her own private ruminations, which are written in first person, and also her conversations with the family and with the priest, which are written in third she begins to relate her side of the story. As the execution date draws nearer, those around her learn that perhaps not everything is as it originally seemed. 
So I thought to, to finish, I'd read a little extract. Um, this comes from quite early on in the novel when Agnes is being moved from Storteborg, the farm where the trial took place and where she's been held in a very small room, uh, to Cornsow, the new, the new farm where she'll wait until they went work out when she's going to be beheaded. I hope it gives you an understanding of how I have tried to capture her voice. They have taken me from the room and put me in irons again. This time they sent an officer of the court, a young man with pox skin and a nervous smile. He's a servant from Kfamur. I recognised his face. When his lips broke apart, I could see that his teeth were rotting in his mouth. His breath was awful, but no worse than my own. I know I am rank. I am scabbed with dirt and the accumulated weeping of my body, blood, Sweat, oil. I cannot think of when I last washed. My hair feels like a greased rope. I have tried to keep it plaited, but they have not allowed me ribbons, and I imagine that to the officer I looked like a monstrous creature. Perhaps that was why he smiled. He took me from that awful room, and other men joined as he led me through the unlit corridor. They were silent, but I felt them behind me. I felt their stares as though they were cold hand grips upon my neck. Then, after months in a room filled only with my own fetid breath and the stench from the chamber pot, I was taken through the corridors of Storteborg into the muddy yard, and it was raining. How can I say what it was like to breathe again? I felt newborn. I staggered in the light of the world and took deep gulps of fresh sea air. It was late in the day. The wet mouth of the afternoon was full on my face. My soul blossomed in that brief moment as they led me out of doors. I fell, my skirts in the mud, and I turned my face upwards as if in prayer. I could have wept from the relief of light. A man reached down and pulled me from the ground as one rests a thistle that takes root in a place it does not belong. It was then that I noticed the crowd that had gathered. At first I didn't know why these people stood about, men and women alike, each still and staring at me in silence. Then I understood that it was not me they stared at. I understood that these people did not see me. I was two dead men. I was a burning farm. I was a knife. I was blood. I didn't know what to do in front of these people. Then I saw Rosa watching from a distance, clutching the hand of her little daughter. It was a comfort to see someone I recognised, and I smiled involuntarily, but the smile was wrong. It unlocked the crowd's fury. The servant women's faces twisted and the silence was broken by a sudden brief shriek from a child. Fiandi! Devil! It burst into the air like an explosion of water from a geyser. The smile dropped from my face. At the sound of the insult, the crowd seemed to awaken. Someone gave a brittle laugh and the child was hushed and led away by an older woman. One by one, they all left to return indoors or to continue their chores until I was alone with the officers in the drizzle, standing in stockings stiff with dried sweat and my heart burning under my filthy skin. When I looked back, I saw that Rosa had disappeared. Now, we are riding across Iceland's north, across this black island washing in its waters, sulking in its ocean, chasing our shadows across the mountains. They have strapped me to the saddle like a corpse being taken to the burial ground. In their eyes I am already a dead woman, destined for the grave. My arms are tethered in front of me. As we ride this awful parade, the irons pinch my flesh until it bloodies in front of my eyes. I have come to expect harm now. Some of the watchmen at Storteborg compassed my body with small violences, chronicled their hatred towards me. A mark here bruises blossoming like star clusters under the skin, black and yellow smoke trapped under the membrane. I suppose some of them had known Nata. But now they take me east, and although I am tired like a lamb for slaughter, I am grateful that I will be returning to the valleys where rock gives way to grass, even if I will die there. As the horses struggle through the tussocks, I wonder when they will kill me. I wonder where they will store me, cellar me like butter, like smoked meat, like a corpse, waiting for the ground to unfreeze before they can pocket me in the earth like a stone. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, perhaps we might have some time for some questions. If anyone has a question, I'm going to pass this mic around. Just be aware you're not going to hear yourself throughout this tour, so don't be thrown. But they will hear you on the internet. So, if anyone has a question? Ladies first. Iceland has a very rich literary tradition. It seems like every one of the 300,000 people there has published at least one book. <laughs> That's a very good question. I was very, right from the start, before probably I even realised that I would write a novel, I, uh, I was very conscious of my status as an outsider, writing about a country that is not my own and a history which I did not grow up with. And I was also very aware, as you say, of the literary heartbeat that Iceland has, and I didn't want to do that any dishonour by coming in and exploiting one of their stories. I didn't want to be accused of appropriation. I wanted to... I guess, create a work of emendation. I really wanted to explore the ambiguity of Agnes. I didn't want to necessarily protest her guilty conviction. So one of the things I decided to do very early on was make sure that I, I covered my tracks, that I researched everything. I spent two years researching this novel full time, which I was able to do because it was part of a PhD. And so not only did I go to great lengths, I went to Iceland for six weeks just to do archival and biographical research. Not only did I go to great lengths to find out Agnes's story, but I also did a huge amount of research into 19th century Iceland at that time. And I only really started writing the book where I felt that I'd reached saturation point, that I knew my stuff and didn't have to return to the notes. That said, even when this book was acquired, I, uh, I was still very anxious about the response of Icelanders. Um, I, I do have an Icelandic publisher. The book's going to be translated into Icelandic probably next year. And I went and I visited them very early this year. I was there over New Year's. And I asked them, I basically said, you know, there are living descendants from some of these people whose names I have borrowed in telling this story, such as Björn Blunda, the district commissioner or the sheriff, who necessarily, because it's written from Agnes's perspective, comes off not as a great guy. I mean, he condemns her to death. And I know that he had something like 13 children. So no doubt he has a lot of descendants running around Iceland who might not agree with the way I've portrayed him. But they were, they were actually really, really great about it. They said, look, the reason why we bought this book is because we think, yes, there will be some people who might not agree with the way in which you've told the story or might not agree with Agnes's characterization, but we know there are people who will. And since it came out in Australia, you know, it's funny, I went back to Australia after spending a year in Iceland, didn't meet a single Icelander for 10 years. I write a book about it, they all come out the woodwork. <laughs> I've had so many Icelanders come up to me and I've just been in England and I had people from the Icelandic embassy and so far everyone has been extremely supportive, which I'm absolutely thrilled about. You know, I think in, in, the, in the author's note, I say that this book is intended as my dark love letter to Iceland. And to Icelanders' credit, I think they have taken that in that particular spirit. Um, but time will tell. It'll be interesting when it comes out over there in, in Icelandic. I might have a few people emailing me in capitals and exclamation marks. <laughs> uh, you said uh, earlier that... Um, <clears throat> In the official records, this woman was a minor character, mm. maybe because she was a woman or for whatever reason. So given that, and uh, maybe that there was very little information about her, how did you um, identify with her to the extent that you could write about things from her perspective? Mm. You know, uh, Robert Heinlein, the science fiction author, had a term called grokking, which is a very intense and deep identification with someone mm -hmm. or a an, empathetic, an empathy with someone that's very deep. So ha if you, given that there wasn't much information about her, how did you put yourself in her place to write about what she felt and what mm -hmm. she saw? Empathy is the right word. Um, this book wasn't written in sympathy. I didn't pity Agnes. And in fact, from what I've discovered, I think were she involved in a similar crime today and in trial, she would still be convicted of at least accessory to murder or manslaughter. Um, 
I, what I always wanted to do, because I was looking for her ambiguity, which I felt wasn't there, I wasn't necessarily concerned so much with working out whether or not she had done it, or I trusted that I would find the specifics of the trial. The empathy came quite naturally, and I wrote her character out of that feeling that she was probably a very complex person who had been reduced to a one-dimensional stereotype. And I think it's because I'd done a lot of other reading of, of contemporary novels because, again, this is being part of a PhD. I was looking at contemporary represent, literary representations of, uh, of historical criminals, books like Alias Grace by Margaret Atwood and Fred and Edie, which is a wonderful book if you haven't read it, by Jill Dawson, which was about Edith Thompson who was hanged in the UK. And something that I found when I looked at the historical documents surrounding, again, these women, these women who were convicted of murder, is that they were always given the same treatment on any possibility of a rich early life or an internal life any possibility for complexity for contradictory behavior for external motives or social situations that it might have impacted upon their particular living or social situation was completely rubbed out and replaced with something that was entirely unequivocal and often quite monstrous and so writing her character everything came down to finding out I guess what her early life was like. I actually did a lot more research into her early life than I did into the actual trial because not a lot remains. You've only got so much data. But also I think starting, I guess, in a, in a funnel, sort of, I guess, if I can draw it that way, starting quite broadly and researching 19th century at, at Iceland, the times that she lived in, I got a very strong sense of what she would have lived through and what her the expectations upon women at that time were. And then slowly, as I gathered biographical data, the little facts that I found were immediately contextualised. So to give you an example, I, um, I read a great deal about kinship networks in 19th century Iceland, a lot of which was through academic articles. So, you know, how important was it to have families? What happened if you were divorced or if you didn't have children? What happened if you were a pauper? And so, and then I discovered in a ministerial record, just a single line where Agnes was, it was her birth record, and it said that she was illegitimate. And had I discovered that quite early on, I might not have given it much consideration. But knowing then, by the time I found out this detail, what the implications of illegitimacy was in Iceland, I immediately realised that this was a woman who didn't have any kinship networks in a society where that was all you had. So a lot of her characterisation came from this, I guess, a mix of research and common sense and logic. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's probably the closest I can get there. Creative intuition too. Um, was this story um, buried in folklore, it appears, because of the lack of primary sources that you've indicated, or since it was the last act of capital punishment, I don't know if that was just for a woman or included men as well, Both. due to the fact that the two women correct if I'm correct it was the, yeah it, sorry it was uh, it was it was the last execution in Iceland she was the man sir uh, t uh, was he was his um was he commuted to life in prison or was it the two women who were the the younger woman women? who was only about 16 at the time was did moved to Denmark and he was executed just before her okay so mm -hmm. my question is did this have legal and social and political re repercussions absolutely okay. absolutely it's interesting this is a story that in some ways is um you can, you can read sources that talk about it as being a horrible event, and indeed it was, and the people in the community where this occurred felt it very deeply. It wasn't the sort of almost Dickensian sort of throwing cabbage leaves and jeering around the gallows type of event. It was a very, very formal, very, very sobering occasion where the district commissioner actually ordered certain people to be in attendance, stood them specifically around the block where these people would be beheaded, and actually there's a very, very good non-fiction book called Engimo and Danlita, which translated means no one may look away. And this was purportedly his instruction to the people attending, you must stand here, you must look, you must see what this was, you know, you must see these people die. And the reason for his insistence was because that district at that particular time was kind of becoming overrun with petty crime. Where there were a lot of thieves, there were a lot of stock, sheep being stolen, stolen and killed and it was basically embarrassing for him he was the kind of single authority that had to report back to in in the case of this execution to the king of denmark and it basically because it reflected badly on him he needed to leave a public example so that was uh, in the official records this is the sort of thing you get you get the official story then you get the slightly more interesting slightly more complex story 
The official reason, what you read in the letters, is that for economic reasons, it, they would save a lot more money to kill them, to order in the axe, create the block, get that shipped in and kill them at the site of the of basically very close to where the crime occurred. The unofficial reason is that he was becoming embarrassed because everyone was turning into a petty criminal and he needed to set a public example. But at the same time, to answer the other part of your question, yes, this is also something that as much as people recognise this event in that historical context has also become mythologised. And I think Agnes in particular has become a myth in the same way that um, perhaps a good comparison would be Ned Kelly in Australia. You know, everyone's heard of Ned Kelly. Everyone has a vague idea of who he is. Some people will know a great deal, you know, the events that happened at Glen Rowan, and in, for instance. Are you all familiar with Ned Kelly? You know, the helmet with the little slit in it. Some of you might be. It's, I'm sorry I don't have an American example. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, of course, the situation was so much more complex and influenced by so many different factors. He, he was often held up as a hero, this bushranger hero. He's become an icon. And I think in many regards, the same happened to Agnes, but in a negative sense. She was kind of demonised. Um, so, yes, it's, it's a very complicated situation, made even more complicated by the fact that no trial transcripts exist to this day. And even the biographical information that I was able to locate was incomplete. So... Hmm. Two quick questions. Um, are you at peace with Agnes now? And then what will you work on next? Am I at peace with Agnes now? I, um, I wrote this book in many ways to, answer, to find answers to the questions I had about her. And while I was able to find out a huge amount of information and get a much more fuller picture of this woman... I, uh, this novel is essentially my own answer to my own question, so it's not satisfactory in the way that it would be to get, a, you know, to actually get those to get, to get proper answers. Um, having written the book, someone asked me recently whether I was ready to move on. It's probably my mother. She thinks I'm obsessed. I'm not. I just call it, you know, intensely interested. Um, she she uh, asked me if I was ready to move on, and I, I think it's a funny thing to ask. I don't think that. Maybe other writers are the same. I don't think you ever sort of abandoned these characters or these stories once you're finished with them. I think you always carry them somehow. But I don't burn with that same curiosity that I once did. And I've stopped having dreams about her. Although, interestingly, my father's just started having them. So who knows? <laughs> Maybe he'll write the sequel. <laughs> as, um, as for my next book, I am, I'm writing another one. Um, Again, it's going to be set in the 1820s, which is something I never really planned to write historical fiction. It was always the story, which just you know happens to be set in a different time, and it's the same with this one. I um, when I was researching this book, because I was trying to cover everything, I ended up reading a lot of British newspapers um, in the in the hope that they would have mentioned the murder in them, and they didn't. But I did come across this fascinating article about, again, another trial concerning three women and the death of a young boy. And without going into too much information, I'm, I'm sure Judy's okay with it, but my Australian publishers told me she'll kick me if I reveal too much too early. Um, and probably it will change at this stage. Basically, they were accused of quite a heinous crime in which superstition was heavily involved. And for those of you who might have already read Burial Rights, folklore and superstition and myth is something that very much interests me and I was able to play around with it a little bit in this book but the next novel in the south of Ireland where this crime occurred will I guess allow me to investigate it and make it much more the focus. I'm very interested in in why superstition is appealing particularly for people who are disempowered, how it can give them agency in their own lives but also how they can use it to subordinate other people. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to be looking at in a very vague way. But yes, south of Ireland, 1820s. in this book as your thesis or was your dissertation you know about how you wrote it and so on uh, so I'm just curious if it, a literary work my PhD? would be um, accepted uh, uh, for a degree in creative writing so each university in Australia is slightly different you can um, there are universities that will give you a, a, a doctorate based on the fact that you um, 
have written a full length work and you're sort of judged and defend just that work. At my university, it's it's a little different. You basically write a seventy percent of your final um, thesis is a creative work or the equivalent if you're a poet, and the remaining thirty percent is called an exegesis, so just ex- exegetical research, which contextualizes the the creative work that you've done. So in my case, um, my I haven't actually submitted my PhD yet. This all became published before I had a chance to, so I'm currently intermitting. Um, but that's okay. My university is supportive. But um, we'll see for how much longer. Um, but yes, yeah, so my remaining uh, 30% is my, my dissertation, if that answers your question. Again, on, on literary representations of, of convicted historical women. Do you want to take one more and then we'll sign some sure. books? Yeah, Anybody absolutely. have a question? Go oh, back here. How do you relate the years leading into British delegalization of slavery in the 1830s after earlier 1807 and the transmigration above um, Scotland, around Mm -hmm. the Scottish and British Isles, possibly related to Iceland, and into the years of um, convict labor Mm -hmm. in Australia. Are there any of the same kinds of social context? If there are, I didn't. I didn't discover any. Um, mainly because I was keeping my research to a very specific time and place. Um, the only real information that I came across regarding mass migration and sort of enforced migration was the late 1800s in Iceland, where a lot of Icelanders basically unable to survive in this very bleak, hostile environment, which was continually suffering volcanic eruptions, which we know from Eyjafjallajökull, the volcanic explosion which halted all air traffic. It would poison the grass, which would poison the stock, which would kill the humans. And then they also had epidemics of smallpox and a whole bunch of other really horrible things happen. And so many um, Icelanders moved to Canada, where we find them around Winnipeg still today. So that that all happened, though, many years after Agnes's death. So I, um, I didn't necessarily have to go into it beyond, I guess, a brief understanding. So I could see, I guess, the early roots of that of that migration. But in terms of its relevance to, I guess, you know, convict settlement in Australia, um, which occurred before that, and also, you know, slavery, I didn't see a great a great deal of um, of relevance because I I was already researching quite broadly. I couldn't even go wider. I would have I would still be researching it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody, especially to Hannah Kent, uh, Judy, her publisher. Also, you have uh, our bookseller, Darby Collins, to thank for your wonderful buffet out there. And again, as I say, thank you for being our live stream audience. Hopefully, for the camera's sake, you're sitting next to the person you're supposed to be sitting next to. Um, And for those of you out there watching, you want to buy a book, please give us a call. Please, you here, buy a book. She will sign them right here. Thanks so much for coming.